welcome to the September edition of The Word. Welcome to Sligo Central Library and to everybody that's watching online. Um, this is our first edition for the autumn term. Um, and this is in association with the BA in Writing and Literature with ATU Sligo. I would just like to ask you at this stage to switch your phones to silent and just to be aware of the exit signs and also the toilets are just outside the door on the left. Um, we are privileged and delighted to have Donald Ryan as our first guest for, for this autumn term of The Word. Donald will be in conversation with Elska Rahel, another person who joined us for The Word last year, and she's um, from ATU Sligo. And we also have, as we've heard already, beautiful music with Shami O'Dowd. Um, we'll, the, re, the conversation will be followed by, by an audience Q&A, which you're all welcome to join in with. And after that, we'll have our open mic in which we'll have five read readers, or five speakers reading from new pieces. Um, I'm now going to officially hand you over to Elska and Donal and let you take it from here. Thank you. Thanks and enjoy. Um, hi, Donal. Hey, Elska. How are you doing? Um, I don't know if I told you <laughs> when I first heard about you as a writer. Um, it was when I was still waiting for my publishing deal with Lily Puss. I remember. And I, got yeah. <laughs> and I got this book in the post from Anthony Farrell, who runs Lily Puss Press. Uh, it's the best novel out of Ireland in a really long time. So I wanted to absolutely hate it. And that was a spinning heart. Um, so I actually didn't read it for about a month. <laughs> um, until I was told, you really have to read this book, it's really brilliant. Um, and I was really, really blown away, obviously, as was um, most of Ireland and the, the world, I think. Um, and since then, you've had how many Booker nominations? Oh, just two. Two? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, you, you've become, and you've had six novels in the last, was that ten years ago? Yeah, ten years yeah. ago, yeah. yeah. Well, I remember it well, Elska, actually, um, because um, Anthony, our mutual publisher at the time asked me to um, read your first novel, Between Dog and Wolf. I'm not just saying it now because you said nice things about my novel, but oh, I'm so ashamed of the blurb that I gave you for that book because it's just not good enough. It was my first oh, time doing a blurb and I had no idea what to do or how to do it or how to go about it. And so I said something quite derivative about a book that honestly did you really know? influenced... I don't, think you did. I don't think you did anything... Yeah. No, it was nice, but I mean, it wasn't good enough, you know, um, well, because it is a that's book that's well, look, no, we'll, um, <laughs> no, I didn't want to start off on that, like, when a lovely thing. It's no, just, but it's true. Yeah. No, if it's true. If it's true, it's true. Like, it is the case that it's, I found that it's been a big influence on my writing career um, ever Oops. since. We're not, anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I, the reason I was saying that, okay, is that the spinning heart, I think, what, what struck me was that it was actually, even though, okay, classically, it's a very well-structured novel, incredibly well-structured novel. Um, but there was something so incredible about the variety of characters that you brought humanity to in that book. Um, and I think that's what kind of I was so envious of <laughs> when I read it. You know, just this sort of amazing ability to make us, I think, is it, oh, I'm going to get the title wrong of but was it a low and quiet sea? Where you From a low and quiet sea, yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think that was the book. Um, where you say to see the light in another's eyes. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, I think for me, as a writer, I thought, yeah, that's, that's the thing. And I, I, I know it's not what every writer wants to do with every book. It was like, that's what I want to do. You know, to make characters where mm -hmm. you see, no matter how kind of gross the characters might be or... Um, or petty, you see that that light, and I think you've achieved that in all your books, actually. Um, and I suppose before we get on to the Queen of Dirt, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that, like that. When you go to a book, is it the character or the characters that drive you, or is it the structure? Because I know they're structurally very interesting as well. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But just to talk about that, is that what drives you? Is it character or? Kind of is, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I often, and I think um, wrongly, um, dismiss structure as an expedient. And I shouldn't because it's so important. Um, and it can be such an integral part. It is, of course, an integral part of a story, how it's told and how it's presented and how the voices are delivered to the, uh, to the reader. But, I mean, when it comes to um, the idea of creating a character, I mean, we never do. You know, we never pluck something from the from the ether. I mean, everything is parallel in some way from our experience or from our, our, ourselves or from things we've witnessed or been privy to or, you know, or just had some kind of um, experience of. And with Spinning Heart, my first novel, I mean, I, I kind of cheated in a way. I mean, every single character was well known to me. 
I mean, these were all composites of people very close to me. And when it came to the situations, I'd walk the walk. You know, I'd worked on building sites and in meat factories, and I'd, I'd done pretty much all the things, you know, except killing people that the characters <laughs> in Spinning Heart do, I swear. Yeah. So, I mean, and you know, and, and the demotic, I mean, the, the rural demotic, I mean, it took me years to strike in that very simple expedient of writing a novel in the language of my own people, you know, in my own language, yeah. my own vernacular, you know, and I mean, and it made the writing of it very easy. You know, I, I, I wrote that novel while my wife was pregnant with her second child and I'd just been promoted in work and I was traveling a lot and um, I literally had no time and so I snatched half hours here and there to write. Is that why they're lots. small chapters? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely, because I had no time yeah. to write a long novel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you say that so it's from life, I understand that, but at the same time you capture the voice of a very young mother um, incredibly well. And I hope it's not sort of <laughs> starting controversial territory, but um, I mean, the, you, you do write a huge array of characters. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, because it's something that I have personal feelings about myself, um, like how do, you, how do you approach that? Like what are your thoughts on the thought that says, oh, you must only write oh, yeah. being, you know, heterosexual white man? from Tipperary. Do you well, know what I mean? My, what, how do you... Absolutely, yeah. My instinctive reaction is always, oh, God, that's the, that's the absolute worst idea you could have about mm. creativity and about art and about fiction. But then when I stop and calm down a bit and think about it, I can, I can, I can see why people feel that, you know, why they, they might think it's wrong to appropriate. Now, I think appropriate is kind of a vulgar term. Um, I don't think we appropriate... I don't think we take anything that we're not licensed to take. We're licensed to tell any story because we have set ourselves the task of writing fiction. And fiction is always an attempt to understand the world yeah. in existence. That's what it is in its essence. And so for us to eschew the, the opportunity to tell stories that aren't our stories would just make no sense. It would negate the whole concept of fiction. Um, but having said that, I mean, Kit Val, my colleague at UL, speaks about this very eloquently and articulately and, and with great heart. Um, and she says, you know, we mustn't dip our pens in the blood of others. And she's so right. Yeah, I understand. So we have yeah, to have yeah. respect, obviously. And we have to do our homework. And I mean, I mean you know, I, if, I, if I had taken a kind of lazy stereotype for, for, for example, the character of Farouk Galahad in From Low and Quiet Sea, I'd hate myself. I couldn't have done it. But in reality, I spent seven years kind of, um, you know, by proxy researching that novel. Um, and like, like, like an idiot, like a fool. And I, I, I make my students in UL promise they won't do this. I started to trash talk myself to a journalist about this. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm a very lazy researcher. Um, and I don't know why I said oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I read that. Yeah. Why did I do it? And <laughs> what I meant by that was I, I, find, it, I find that I have to make mm. myself be assiduous and be forensic about research. Um, I didn't mean that you I don't, don't do it. You don't enjoy that part of it kind of thing. Yeah. And you, pretty much every, every review of that book said, well, Donald Ryan is a self-confessed lazy said, researcher. He said, he said it's really, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the thing is, reading that, I actually use that character as an example sometimes. Um, because for me, reading it, I thought, this is a father and a husband. And that's okay. Mm. It, that's what I felt, was that that's okay to try to, to, to understand another person's situation through what you do know, and then add what you don't do, Oh, absolutely, you know I mean? absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, that's what we do, sure, yeah. And I suppose, th this just came to mind yesterday because, or the day before, where we were looking at a James Baldwin essay, and he said, um, the, and now, again, I don't think this is the role of all art, but the role of art is to make the world a more human place mm -hmm. to live in. And reading your work, I sort of see, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's the kind of drive I see, you know. Um, I reread um, The Thing About December, which I, I love that. I love that book. I love that character um, and all the characters. And I think that that's what you do when you give humanity or the light in the eyes of all these others do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that, that's how it felt to me. Um, and the other thing was the language. You're talking about using your own language. And I know you write very um, lyrically sometimes, but sometimes, and th th really beautifully, but um, sometimes the lines that struck me, like when I was rereading that book, I think it was a, a line like, for finish, I'll get this wrong, I'll get it wrong, but it was literally sort of... Um, for finish, there's no more going outside the gate anymore. Was that it? Yeah. For finish now, really, there's yeah. no more going out the gate anymore. That's what it was. And I don't know what it was, but it's, it's the simplicity of that language and how it captures um, 
just so much. That's what really struck me. And that strikes me too about people like the character in that book, that they will be almost completely, um, they're just laconic and almost completely silent. But when they do speak, they can, they can issue profundities in, in what are, you know, at, at first hearing um, some very innocuous phrases. It's amazing and so how much, much they'll tell you about themselves and about their situation in just little snatches of language. It's amazing. And that character, I mean, that's kind of another thing that struck me. Again, you know, it's what I've been reading lately. Um, but there's something, John Z, he's, a, he's actually a very wise character. And I just, I'm not really sure how you managed to do that, because he's not a Lenny character mm. at all. Um, and he kind of is a gom, et cetera, et cetera. But there's all this wisdom in there. And I wondered, as I, I was kind of thinking back over all the books, and I thought, is there something here, is there a theme here of sort of usurping that kind of supremacy of the intellect or... Do you know what I mean? Or, yeah, well, or, or the, the over-articulation or the, the... I'm always kind of fascinated by the deficit that can exist between what is presented to the world and what goes on inside. And, you know, and I know loads of people who would spend hours here and would absorb huge amounts of information and understanding, would process things really well and would analyse things really well and would keep a really close um, measure of the pulse of the world, but would never display this. You know, would walk around, as my mother would say, with her mouth hanging open, looking out of their mouth like a gum, you know, yeah, with the arse yeah. hanging out of their trousers. And you would give them tuppence, you know. And that's the way she, and that's, you know, and, but she would know that they weren't really like that. Yeah, you know, she'd know just behind that there's this understanding and this attempt to put a grammar for themselves in the world and to negotiate the world, you know. And our eternal lives can be so rich, you know, and we don't have an obligation to, to put on an act at all. And I think when someone's aware of that and accept that about themselves, it can be a very beautiful thing, you yeah. know. And Stunning. that's the way John Z is, I think. I mean, John Z, for me, was a beautiful character. I mean, he was almost saintly. I mean, he's, he's almost martyred, I think, in the, in the novel. Um, oh. But, you know, that's, yeah. Because <laughs> we were speaking earlier about how the film that was made in, in Irish of, of, the, of the book has a different ending. And um, initially, I was outraged by this. Because for me, you know, what happens to John Z has to happen for yeah. the story to, to make sense. But for, as the film, it works completely. You know, does, it, I it haven't seen the film, so... Fully. Does, oh, yeah, well, yeah. I'll say not so. But, you know... <laughs> It, that can happen, you know, that, um, that, that's, and that's for me actually, it brought it home to me how for me, in my, in my books, the characters do kind of take primacy, primacy a bit over their stories. So whatever happens to them isn't as, actually as important as... Sometimes, yeah, it seems that way. Being yeah. true to them and how they yeah. respond yeah. to them. Um, and that book's written by the months of the year. Mm. The calendrical form as... Um, an eminent critic pointed out. It was yeah, the only, what, the only interesting thing about the book, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you have other books structured around, say, the weeks of pregnancy and so on. And mm. I'm just, I didn't ask you this question earlier, but I am wondering, do you set out the structure before you literally put pen to paper? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, I have to. And it's, I have to. It's because I, I lived for 10 years in, I, I lived for way too long in the flat that I lived in in college. Um, so I started college in Limerick in 1994. And in 2004, I was still renting it. I wasn't quite living there, but I still, <laughs> I still had the lease, pretty much. I couldn't leave it. Um, oh, there were various reasons why I couldn't leave, but um, I lived in that flat for about 10 years, and for much of that time, I was on my own, and for great swathes of it, I had a broken heart, and I had a, had a clerical job in the civil service. I was a typical, stereotypical, tortured artist, you know, with loads of time, you know, and loads of mental space to write novel after novel, or short story after short story, and every single time, I sat down to write, I would end up burning what I'd written. Actually, bur actually burning. Burning, yeah, because I started, I always started to write into a void. And I always start, I, and I, I could never control a sentence or to a paragraph. To write into a void, is that what you said? Yeah, to write into mm -hmm. a void, yeah. And, you know, and every story I was writing stopped making sense. And, you know, and, and I was spending pages describing a man picking up um, a glass of water to drink it, you know. And, oh God, I and then I just hate what I was doing. And, I mean, the very simple notion of, deciding on a way of telling the story before I started to tell it never occurred to me, you know. So all of those, I mean, my dad used to come in now and again and he'd do a sortie. He had a key for the apartment and he'd, he'd pick, pick up pieces of paper here and there and he kept, he kept a little archive in the attic in my parents' house um, of all this stuff, yeah. And then, and then years later, by accident, threw it out into a skip. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, greater. And actually, I, never, I remember what happened. Um, I was offered money from my archive, unbel unbelievably, by an American university. I said, Dad, it's going to pay off at last all those trips into Limerick when I wasn't there to, to hoover stuff up from the apartment. And he went white. He went, oh, Jez, do I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
<laughs> and then, and then I, had to re- I had to lie. I said, oh, they're only offered a few hundred quid anyway. That doesn't matter one bit. It's grand. <laughs> they'll still buy the archive. It's fine. Great. He was so upset. Oh, God. But, you know, that, that's, that happened. I mean, and that's why I was saying today, actually, um, the course you guys have in, in ATU Sligo is so powerful. I mean, if I had had something like that to go to... Um, I know, I would have loved it, yeah. so At any point in, my, in, my, in those 10 years, it would have been so different, you know? It really would. Then again, I think everything you, you write about in The Spinning Heart, you had to live. You know, you might not have... Maybe, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, were you working, am I right about this, in the employer, employer rights or employer Yeah, I worked rights? for the National Employment Rights Authority um, rights, yeah. since disbanded, actually. They were merged back into the Liber- Liberal Relations Commission. But, you know, um, my job was... I was a labour inspector, so my job was to make sure people got their employment rights. And it was a fairly involved job because these cases would open and just roll on and on and it burgeon and then, you know, you'd have employers, you know, getting barristers and solicitors to come at you and, you know, and, and we didn't really have much support. So we were kind of, um, we were doing our own prosecutions um, and we were going to court literally half cocked, like, you know, <laughs> bunch of civil servants, you know, just heading off into the court and trying to prosecute these cases. Um, but we started to get really good at it and get really into it and, you know, but it was very time consuming. But um, I ended up writing a spinning heart while I was doing that. And my boss, poor Danny Losty, my boss, when the book came out, he went, oh, Jesus, Donny, that's not one of your cases, it's actually the book, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you know, it's, it's kind of a composite of loads of, loads of different yeah, cases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I took a career break shortly afterwards, um, to Danny's relief. Not and then, for that yeah. long. Hmm? Not for that long. I can't believe six novels in... Yeah, well, I took, I took oh, three years off. Oh, career break from yeah. him? From yeah, the, yeah, yeah, from that okay, job. Okay. And then I came back for a few weeks and then resigned fully because I got the job in UL, so it was fine. But you know, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to go writing stories about the stuff you're doing in your job in civil service. But but it's so, I mean, know. it's so valuable. You know, I think you probably... I think so. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I saw stuff happening. I know I have to say that nearly every employer in Ireland at the time during the, 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 the depths of the recession were unbelievable. You know, I mean, people were just incredibly good to their employees, but the people that weren't really weren't. You know, I mean, people were just so... Some people were so badly used and their stories were not being told. Yeah. You know, and their voices weren't being heard. I mean, people were literally abandoned. I mean, my best friend, my oldest friend after leaving school at 17 and working every single day of his life on building sites, you know, after, after years and years, after, I suppose, 15 years of that, um, finally found himself unemployed for the first time in his whole life and went to sign on, to draw his stamp, to draw back the money he'd paid in week after week after week and was told, never paid. as far as the government is concerned, you never worked a day in your life. After all that back-breaking labour, and I mean literally never missing a day. I mean, this guy would drink 15 pints and go in the next morning to work, and he'd work all day in a building site yeah. and never miss a beat, you know. Imagine being told that. You know, and these stories were not being told. Yeah. And I think, you know, when something's reported as reportage, when it's reported in the media, it's, it, it's good, but it can be kind of cold and clipped and necessarily um, perfunctory, and it can be very forgettable very quickly. But I think, you know, the, the, but that, that kind story's of, not. I mean, yeah, you it's know. counterintuitive. But when you make something up about something real, it actually will 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 be more true. It'll mm-hmm. feel more true. I think. Um, sorry, I'm very conscious that we want to get on to your reading oh, of yeah. Cream Line. I just want to ask you quickly. Um, another thing that um piqued my jealousy <laughs> was that when I was refusing to read the book, and she was saying, you know, he just. He, you know, he works all day, then he comes home and he writes while he's watching TV at night. Is that true? Yeah. Please tell me it's not true that he writes. Well, I have no choice, really, but in fairness, no, it's because um, when I w- w- wrote Spinning Heart, um, and, and Marie was pregnant, and she, um, she developed this pregnancy addiction to a TV show called America's Next Top Model. That was just, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was horrendous stuff. I mean, it was aesthetically very pleasing, obviously. But I mean, thematically, it was just awful. It was you, this American one just screaming at models and making them cry. And I couldn't handle it. <laughs> and so, I mean, I couldn't share the living room with her. So I went to the kitchen or upstairs. I should say, well, just take off and write your novel. I'm your nine me. I'm trying to... And she was completely hooked. It was on all day long, every day, on Living Channel. You know, it was on morning, noon, and night. <laughs> so she just lay, she lay on the couch having morning sickness all day and watching this, this TV show. So no choice. And it's a very small house. Um, so I'd go into the kitchen and go, sure, look, I might as well write my novel now while I'm here. So this background hum of that TV show, it was lovely, it was, it was like lovely comforting, yeah. yeah. You know, it was just really nice, and it was kind of, um, it was a means of me not getting too involved, you know, and it was lovely, it was great, yeah. it, was, it okay. made it very easy. It's not the answer I wanted, I wanted. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. But your um, memory was different, like. Well, we start with the reading, and then we'll talk yeah, about the Queen of sure. Ireland. Island. Okay. okay, I don't know why I lit on this particular chapter to, to be the reading chapter for this book, but it is, anyway. Um, 
this novel is set in my home village of Newtown, County Tipperary. Now, I don't name the village because then you have people from the village going, oh, I know that person, I know that person, but it is in a way, it's my home village. Um, and the family that the book is about, it's four generations of women from the same family living in this house together, um, eventually four. At this point, one of the characters um, is proposed to by her late husband's brother. <clears throat> it's called Proposal, it's a very short chapter, 500 words. Chris proposed to mother, oh, it's from the point of view of Saoirse, who is Eileen's, the proposee's daughter. Chris proposed to mother on an evening in early summer with his working clothes on him, as though he'd been seized suddenly by some amorous impulse, some wild desire that had been lying dormant, he came rushing down from the fields to the village, half cocked, as Nana said later, though she didn't wholly disapprove of his hastily conceived and poorly executed plan. He stood a long while at the side door, mumbling. Saoirse had never seen a redder face. Mother had stepped back to let him in. She had a cigarette just lit, and she was pulling on it deeply. Come in, Chris, she said through a cloud of blue smoke. I won't, Eileen. My boots are covered in muck. I won't drag it in a longer clean floor. Eric, clean my arse, said Mother, and Chris laughed, a high chuckle, the way he always did. Chris enjoyed Mother, and she liked him right back. From somewhere, from the ether, or the blue heavens, or the fumes of new growth, or agricultural diesel, he drew courage and he made his proposal. Eileen, I was wondering, Saoirse heard him say, wondering what, Chris? I was wondering if it wouldn't be the best thing for all concerned, if you and me, if I and you, if you and I, if me and you, and then he said it straight, nearly in a shout, will you marry me? Saoirse saw mother bend forward as though someone had struck her in the stomach, and she grabbed in her two fists the lapels of Chris's overalls, and pulled him into the kitchen, slamming the door closed in the same movement. Chris's eyes were opened wide in shock. Whatever he'd been expecting, it wasn't to be manhandled off his feet. He straightened himself and put a hand over his face and drew it downwards, as if to reset himself, to regain something of his passive countenance. What kind of rubbish are you talking, Chris? Chris didn't know, it seemed, what kind of rubbish he'd been talking, but only ploughed. We wouldn't have to you know yourself, be married in the fullness of the word. We just, you know yourself, take the bad look off of things. You'd have, you know, a bit of company. Yourself and the baby. Baby? Saoirse was 11 years old, and she opened her mouth to protest this slight, but some vague wisdom rose from within her and silenced her. Paddy and Chris called her the baby, and maybe they always would. I love you dearly, Chris, said Mother, and I'd be a lucky lucky woman if I were free to marry you but I'm still in my heart and my soul married to your brother and I will be I'd say for all of eternity Chris said it was okay he was sorry and mother said she was sorry too and she kissed his cheek and Chris dragged himself back up the hillside and didn't come down again for a long long time that's poor old Chris, <laughs> that's poor Chris. <laughs> um this is a great book, <laughs> but is it, is, it, is it something, I mean, I think it is, it's sort of against form in some ways. I mean, it's got that um, meta element going on. I don't know how much to give away um, going on, but it's, it's sort of, I, when I read this book, I was thinking back on your other books, and I thought mm -hmm. maybe that's been there all along, that kind of refusal of the character to adhere to the story that's being told. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, to, to, to fit into somebody else's story of them. Oh, absolutely, Elska. And I feel that all the time. And actually, especially so with this book, it really felt as though, and I know, it's, I know this isn't the case now, but it really felt this way. Um, it felt as though it came from outside. It felt as though it was whispered to me. And what happens in the book had to happen. And whenever I attempted to impose a narrative, the characters just well, kicked against it and wouldn't let me. Yeah, I mean, because I sat down to start that novel in a panic because I had spent two years writing a novel that my publisher said they couldn't publish. Um, yeah, and I thought Good. it was perfect. And I spent, and I really thought now this is my opus. You know, this is me pulling together all of my experience and all of my skills and, and making this pristine thing, you know. And so I sent off this novel and I went off, like Chris did, half cocked. And I remember thinking to myself, 
what did my editor even say about this? I mean, he, he surely won't even have any edits. I mean, it's actually word perfect, you know? And <laughs> a, a, a few weeks later, I got a very long and quite circumspect and obviously very well thought out politic email um, that was, I knew, composed jointly by my editor and my publisher. And were saying, okay, you know, maybe sometime we publish this, but it left me radically changed. It left me, you know, rewritten from word one to word 80,000. Um, yeah, I got an awful shock. And so the wind was gone right out of my sails, you know, and I was thinking, how could I be so stupid? Like, how could I have thought this was a great novel? But were they right? Or, like, when you Actually, look at it now? Really, you know, I was thinking afterwards, now, I mean, I'd never, because I, I know it's, it, it, it's obviously necessarily subjective, you know, but I mean, I know they were looking at this and they were looking at the previous um, six books and thinking it doesn't quite fit, you know, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit as, as a so-called Donald Ryan novel, but of course... I don't know if this fits either, really. Yeah, I know, that's the way, thing, is it? yeah. You know. But I can see absolutely how this is an easier sell. But it is, I do love it, because it just felt like it was it gifted to the universe. It just kicks all the time, like it just keeps kicking against... It was the kind of a pulse to it, yeah. It was definitely yeah. a kind of pulse to it that was kind of the pulse of my heart, basically. <laughs> you know, the mounting relief I was feeling as that novel started to come together, because it, every day I sat down to write, it just, the, the vignette I had to write was presented to me from somewhere, I don't know where, but it felt like a voice being whispered, you know, and I've, I, I, I just have a, a feeling about my ancestors in heaven, you know, my grandmother <laughs> and my aunt-in-law Patricia, um, seriously, and that kind of humour and that kind of voice, you know, and these people who I think, you know, um, might from somewhere else have had sympathy for me, you know, <laughs> sort of the feeling <laughs> my fear about, just the one in an awful way, we'll send him something. It, did, it felt like a gift from the universe. Well, well done. <laughs> um, can we talk very quickly? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I mean, I don't know what I sort of want you to say about this, um, except maybe confirm what I think, um, which is that we have these recurring characters, and I wonder why Alexander and Josh ended up mm. in this book. Did they just...? Um, I couldn't let them go, really. I, I loved those characters, and actually... I. A character I felt really sad about was Alexander, and I felt sad that I hadn't given him enough space in Strange Flowers. I think it's one of the flaws of that novel, um, that Alexander hasn't more space, because he was such a beautiful character. Um, and I didn't, get, I didn't allow myself to develop him properly, I think. Um, and actually, Maybe that wasn't his book, you know. No, exactly, yeah. I, I mean, it, could have, it could have been a very different novel, actually, I think, if I had done that. But you can always go back, and you can always make characters live again, um, and that's a lovely thing. And I, the, the characters of... Um, of um, Josh and Honey, I, you know, I was just fond of them, you know, and, and, I, I could, and the, the role they play in that just seemed right, it just seemed to fit, you know, and the fact that the Aylwards and um, the Elmwoods and the Gladneys um, all knew each other and had this kind of connection, um, it just came together, you know, it mm. just, it felt like these, these pieces all just kind of slot into place, you know, this, and this, this, this world kind of opened up. He's such a brilliant character, Josh. I mean, he's so awful. <laughs> he's, he's so likable. Yeah. This happens a um, lot with, with Josh. And, I, um, and, you know, I base Josh on myself pretty much, you know. And people go, oh, God, I, I hate that Josh. I was wondering, is he's this like, like what... Yeah, is this, I was because he is a writer, you know, yeah. of sorts. Um, but I can see what you mean, absolutely. Yeah, he's completely self-obsessed. Um, and he's a narcissist. And, you know, and he's very unsure of himself. And he's very decent as well, you know. But he's, I mean, he, he, he does... He behaves badly and... He feels terrible about it and he tries to be a good person, you know, like he's, he's just, a, he's human. Yeah. But that, I mean, that really clever thing you do, that you, you play with the idea that he's, he's telling her story, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, you know, that kind of, I suppose, refers back to what I was saying about your role as a writer and yeah. the characters sort of insisting on telling, being the ones to yeah. tell their story. That's the thing, you see. Yeah. I think um, I, I, I have Josh appropriating badly in, in that book. You know, he takes, he, he literally steals Saoirse's story and but makes it something it, of his he? own, yeah. And, and he makes all of her characters into gargoyles and caricatures. And, you know, he, he has this kind of, um, this overly dramatic, pathetic thing that, that she just rails against. Um, and I wasn't, I, lit I genuinely wasn't thinking this is very clever. I wasn't. Um, but it, it came together well, you know, those three strands. But of course, you know, I mean, for some readers, it's it's too forced and it's too it, it doesn't ring true. But for me, it did. It rang but it, feel, true. it feels like that was they were sort of wrangling against any other yeah. form, you know. And is that the kind of the difference between refusing to allow the characters to speak, like what Josh was doing, which is literally using somebody's story to tell his own in a way? Yeah, yeah. Um, to what we should be 
not that it's a preaching. I'm making it sound really preachy. It's not a preachy novel at all, but just what we should be doing, which is trying to enter somebody else's story. Oh, I think so, yeah. I you think know. so. I mean, I, I've, I've had arguments about this, actually, and I was at the Franco-Irish Literary Festival a few years ago, and I was talking about my so-called process. The, the invigilator said, Donald, describe to us how you wrote the thing about December. And I said, oh, God, I completely inhabited the character of John Z. And every night I sat down for a few hours and I became John Z. And I felt the pain he was feeling. And I experienced what I make him experience in the book. And, you know, it took a lot out of me. And I, was, I suppose I was being a bit precious about the whole thing. And there was a French novelist there on the panel. And she said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that couldn't be true. That's, that's no way to write a novel. There's, nobody could write a novel like that. It's, you have to be completely objective. You have to cast the cold eye. You should definitely go to Jade's on, on your narrative. And you have to be completely above it, looking down upon it coldly. And I, while she said all this, I was nodding like an idiot, going, yeah, oh, yeah, yes, yeah. Oh, yes, you do. Sorry, sorry. She was speaking French, yeah. And I, I was agreeing with her, pretending I knew what she was saying. You were speaking French. No, she was speaking, she was speaking French. French. But I, so I didn't know what she was saying. But I was getting a delayed um, translation of my earpiece. And so it was too late for me to, you know, to assume the proper expression. So it's going, ah, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'm a fucking idiot. You're dead. Yep, you're right. <laughs> but I, I think, I do think that I'm right there about that. You know, I mean, I think, I think that the best way to write fiction that's going to resonate is to try your absolute best to feel what the character feels. Yeah. Um, and I certainly think reading that book, you were so immersed in his world. I mean, I, I just, yeah. I don't know what to say, except it's just such a brilliant book. Oh, thanks, um, it, did you write that before Spinning Heart initially? Did, yeah, 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 and then... Mm. Um, so why do you think Spinning Heart came out first and then...? Um, because the Spinning Heart was, at the time, it was um, filling a perceived gap in the market for fiction that dealt squarely with the uh, recession. As I wrote the thing okay. about December, boom was still on, basically. Um, and uh, I wrote the thing about December... Well, that thing about December does as well, in a way. It does, well, yeah, yeah, it does, but um, it kind of bookends. It, it's kind of set at the start of the... When, as, as the prices begin to burgeon and the whole thing started to get crazy. But I wrote that novel as a gift for my wife because I wanted to impress her. And she's almost impossible to impress, so I have to actually write novels to impress her. Like, there's no... You know, it's, it's the lengths I have to go to. I never thought it'd be published. And I wrote Spinning Heart, literally, with no expectation about getting published, just to keep my hand in. Because you needed that yeah, story. I wanted, on, two, yeah. I wanted to have two novels written. And then I was going to forget the whole thing. I was happy just to have them extent in the world, not to be published, just leave them there. Um, and so that's my only kind of propulsion was that, was just the idea of having mm. written two novels. So I could, I could claim to myself I was a novelist and fulfilled my ambition. And that was it. There was no other ambition, because I am terminally unambitious. I have no ambition in life whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Professionally or any other way. I'm just gonna, I'm not even gonna give that a comment. I'll just say, yeah, okay, all right, don't know. <laughs> no, no, it's true, seriously. I have, to be, I have to be dragged, kicking and screaming into kind of, uh, into, you know, pushing myself forward. Like, my, you know, I always, I've always worked, all of us, but I've never, I've never wanted to. Uh, I will get this or, prize or I'll. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've got a small house, I don't want a big house because I don't need it, you know. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, you know, like most people, you know, I'm happy with my life, basically. So do you ever stop writing? Do you ever have periods where you don't write? Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I mean, I hardly ever write. Really? Yeah, I mean, Please, I write. I've got loads of students here. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, you have to write every single day. <laughs> every <Absolutely>. morning. <laughs> <laughs> but look, everyone's different. You know, for me, I, I write in very short, very intense bursts um, when I'm free. Yeah, okay. And is that the short... I mean, are th this did feel like vignettes that were just... It's, it's funny hearing you describe it because they seem to just burst onto the page um, or from the page. Um, and we can, it's like the world went on mm. between chapters. So it's almost like I don't know, you close the window and then you open it again, something new has happened, and you close it again, something new has happened. And you can, it's enough for you to follow. Yeah, but did I was you write about that. the in between and cut it out? Or? No, I was very careful about that. I was very careful about making sure that each vignette um, didn't depart too radically from the previous one. But I was okay. allowing myself to, you know, to have that accordion kind of concept of, you know, where I could skip a few years and have a few days together and then maybe go ahead mm -hmm. a few weeks, you know. And I, I was very determined that nobody would be, would, would be on Goodreads saying, I had no clue what was going on. I was, I was lost. completely lost. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'm going to make sure everybody, I was gonna, I'm going to herd every single reader into this field here and I'm going to just declaim to them. Um, and so I was very careful about that. But I, I did want it to be kind of, you know, episodic and in you know, a kind of vignette form. And the shift in characters, did you... Sorry, I know I'm talking a lot about process here. It's just, I find it really interesting. Did you literally write it chronologically or did you write one character and then another character? No, I wrote chronologically, all right, yeah. yeah. I mean, pretty That's much so as it's published is how I wrote it's it. Like, oh, God. 
<laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's, I, I was given, literally, I remember I heard Kevin Power saying this, and I heard Mary Costello say the same thing, that she reckons, I bet you'd think the same, Elska, that every writer gets a 12-week novel once in their career. You know, and that was my 12-week novel. That was yours, okay. The one I'm, wait, I'm still definitely waiting, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it'll come. Yeah, you get a 12-week novel. But, you know, maybe, maybe that's not true, but it, it does seem that way. It? it does have this urgency and mm -hmm. this sort of... The panic. There's there a panic. propulsion. Well, that's not what it feels like. Yeah. Really. Well, that was derived from my panic, like to get it done, because I was so far over um, my deadline, you know, and, <laughs> and I'd, give, I'd given them what turned out to be a dud for them anyway, you know, so I, yeah. had, to, I had to produce something fairly quick. Yeah, well, well done. It's a beautiful book. Yeah, thanks, um, Miguel, it's good. And thank you for talking to us all tonight. And my that pleasure. Reading. Um, I think we're going to listen to Shane again, and then we're going to take questions and answers. Am I right? Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Donald. That's all. That's all. Thank you, Oscar. Thanks very much. Um, I'll try, try, try a couple of jigs for you. Uh, for the, first, uh, the, the first two are, uh, I think, lo locally written. The uh, for, uh, first one was written by myself. You don't get much more local than that, I think. So it's gonna, but uh, the, 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 the uh, second one was written by uh, um, a man called Kevin Burke, Griff, at a player he called it Across the Black River. And there's, the, the third one is so well known, I can't think of the name of it, but you might, you might, you might know it to hear it. Uh, and you hope you enjoy these. <laughs> We're taking questions from the floor now. Um, do we have any questions? Una.
earlier today you mentioned a story about um, your mother and it really struck me about being an, a writer in Ireland and your mother offering <laughs> your services. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was wondering if you might just recount that story because I, I found it quite moving and, and, and funny. And the other thing I wanted to ask you was um, you just talked about um, being, like being a civil servant but writing, but this desire to write. And I was just wondering like when that came or whether that was something that when mm -hmm. you were young or like suddenly something happened in your life and you were reading and just thinking <coughs> about, I want to tell these stories. So two, two parts, if that's... Thanks, Una. Um, <laughs> well, my mom, um, until recently, worked in Tesco's in Nina um, on the till. And <laughs> occasionally people would arrive at her till with their manuscripts in their hand and they'd say, and will you ask Donald to read that for me? And tell him, <laughs> I, want, I want some feedback, um, especially on chapter four. I want a good bit of feedback on that one now. And um, also, I need a bit of help getting a publisher and an agent, so you might start him out. And she go, now, have you bus pass? I do. Go into Limerick, <laughs> get off the bus at the Hurlers pub, go down to the Schumann building in UL, go in the main door, turn left, SGO4, he'll be delighted You're to see you. are giving away the number now. <laughs> 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 in front of a room of writers. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, and you know, so I, I, <laughs> I interrupted a few times in my, in my uh, daily routine. Um, but, you know, the impulse to write, I think, um, I, I think it's the only thing I ever really wanted to be, um, except, except a boxer. I wanted to be a boxer for a while. And then my dad took me to a gym in Limerick um, just to see what would happen if I became a boxer. And the fella about that size knocked me out. So, <laughs> and he was so nice about it. He remember me picking up going, just sorry about this. <laughs> and he was cradling me like this and rubbing my head going, I'm sorry about that. It was lovely. And I knew then this wasn't for me. I just, I hated being hit. Um, so, <laughs> and then actually, it's actually boxing related. But um, when my, my great hero, Barry McGuigan, lost his, um, his, his, lightweight title to Steve Cruz in 1986 and my heart broke and um, I, to ameliorate my pain I wrote a short story about Barry having a comeback fight in Ireland against Steve Cruz and I wrote the story about the fight taking place in McDonough Park in Nina um, and I organised a fight with, and um, Barry won and his dad sang Danny Boy and Steve and Barry were friends afterwards it was all great and I just felt I remember the feeling of relief I felt as I, as I wrote the story, and I felt this power, you know, I, felt the, I really felt the power of language, I mean, how language could, could change the world, you know, in a small way, it changed the world in a fictional way, but it made me feel so much better, you know, and it was and just That's, that's the first thing. story you wrote, that you remember? Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. Mm. And I remember, I, I told that story somewhere recently, and Barry McGuigan actually tweeted, thanks Donald, that was lovely. Now, I don't have a Twitter account, he tweeted to my, oh, my wife, it's, I started crying, no, I remember, because he's still, I mean, he's such an incredible human being, Barry, you know, it was a lovely moment, so it was really lovely, and, but from then on, I kind of knew that this is, was all I wanted to be, but of course, um, being an idiot, I, I lied to myself about it, and I lied to everyone about it, and I wouldn't really admit it, um, but my parents kind of knew, and my mum knew um, that I was starting to write a novel one, one time, and, and she kept kind of asking now and again, how's the novel going, are you going to finish it, do you think? And then I didn't finish it. And I remember she just said, did you abandon the novel you did? I remember she felt, I, I knew she felt really disappointed for me, but she had no way really to articulate how or why, you know, she, we just left it at that, you know. But I could sense this desperate disappointment she had because she knew as well that this was the, my only ambition in life was to be a writer. You know, it's all I ever wanted to do. But I mean, like, you know, I, I deflected it, I pushed it away, I was embarrassed about it, I lied about it, you know. I'm, I kind of had to come out as a writer. It was just yeah. strange thing. No, I think know? a lot of people have that. Oh, yeah. Feeling. yeah. I mean, I still have friends who don't talk about it. You know, they're embarrassed about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not mentioned. Like, it's kind of this, 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 this kind of shameful thing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's very strange, though. But, you know, I think that there are loads of people for whom it's not something that's in their lexicon. You know what I mean? It's just they're not into books and writing and reading. Yeah. And that's it. And it's fine. It's totally. I mean, you can live a very full life, obviously, that way. But... <laughs> it's, it's, but being a writer is a very strange thing. It is, you know. It's and, weird, yeah, yeah. You have to, if you, if it's what you have to do, you have to do it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, I know I said earlier that I, I hardly ever write, but in, in in reality, I always write because I I do believe that the time you spend considering a story and working a story out in your head and developing a character in your head, that's really important mm -hmm. writing time. You know, that's really important work. It's probably the hardest work you do, actually. You know, developing the story in your head before you sit down to write, because if you sit down to write with nothing tune your pen, you'll sit there, tune your pen, and then you'll go on the internet, and then you're finished, forget it, you know. So I think that, that, that time you spent, um, Paul Lynch calls it being in a state of receptivity, you know, and he, so he said, you know, you can actually lie down on the couch for the whole day and not feel guilty about it because you'll have been working hard you're all day. Working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, don't. <laughs>
<laughs> not the place to say that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Loosely. Uh, good evening, uh, Donal. Uh, the phrase cut of tart has entered my own uh, family's vocabulary but, uh, <laughs> and wearing a hurl out. Um, but I two very quick questions. Do you at all bristle when you hear the phrase rural Gothic? Oh, God, yeah. Okay, that's... Uh, mm. And the other one, I've heard you speak about the precarious nature of writing and the financial pressures on authors. And in the light of the onslaught of people like Jeff Bezos and others, you know, what could be done to, to insulate writers from, from the day-to-day from the -day, uh, pressures, no more than anybody else at the moment? Thanks a million. Um, it's a great question. And, you know, I don't know that we necessarily deserve to be insulated. Um, because you choose to be a writer, it doesn't give you any right to be um, cosseted or to be paid, you know, unless you produce something that's worth paying for. That's the thing, I think, that, that really has to be considered. You know, you have to work hard at your craft. And you have to be assiduous and you have to be rigorous about the elements of craft and you have to really think about what makes a good story and what makes a saleable story, a readable story, what makes a story worth people's hard-earned money. Um, you know, so that's, you know, and, and of course there are loads of ways to make money as a writer without producing novels or short stories. You know, you, writing, is, is, writing is a profession and a craft that deserves all the rigour and all the consideration of any profession or craft. Um, but I think that... Um, Obviously, if you're a writer, you're self-employed, you're non-unionized, there's no, there's no body, you know, lobby, there's no huge bodies lobbying for you, or there's no bodies that have a huge voice or a huge, a huge kind of lobbying power. So you're, you're kind of on your own, you know. I mean, I've never been a full-time writer. I was actually, sorry, for three months one time. And there were tough three months, you know, three months, three terror-filled months, really, and three very unproductive months, you know. Um, and then I, I said, this isn't going to work, um, because I just couldn't bear the idea of not knowing how much money I'd have the following month. That's just, that's, that's just the way. I mean, lots of people can live, you know, in a different way. They can live a different life and they can, they can, you know, exist in the gig economy, so-called, and they can, you know, um, subsist. I mean, I know loads of writers, actually, who have, who have rickets because um, all they eat is the cheese and wine you get at book lunches. <laughs> and they exist, they subsist on those little ardeurs you get and pieces of cheese. And, you know, and they're malnourished and they're gaunt and they're skinny and they're bony. And, um, and they say to me, Oh man, no, you have to give up the job. You know, you have to do well at full time, man. <laughs> so now you're grand, thanks. <laughs> I'm fine. I but like I mean, food. we have already talked as well about how the experiences of working mm. are quite, I think, for your work, very important. I don't think you'd be writing the same books. Um, and I actually use your, the Spinning Art as an example, um, along with Lucia Berlin, <laughs> with students to say, like, you know, and what Love Notes from a Building site. And, and, you know, there's so many books that I think are so. Sorry, this is not my Q and A, <laughs> but but you know that the, they they depend so much on the experience of the world, and yeah. you don't want yeah. to be Montagna, do you? I mean, all the time. You see, I mean, I think like I think um, you need to be able to go out into the world and absorb things, um, and try before you try to put a written grammar on the world, put a grammar on it for yourself, you know, and 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 you know, and distill the things around you and the things you witness um, into something that can be made unnatural because, I mean, you know, fiction is unnatural. We try to impose narrative on what really is, when you look closely at it, inchoate and incoherent and, and random. You know, existence is random. Um, the way that the universe fashions, fashioned itself yeah. from nothing, it seems random. And so we put the story arc, on, we put an arc on, on experience. And I mean, if you think of, the, you know, the, 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 the first cave paintings in Lycio in France, I mean, they literally are in an arc. I mean, they, they are very literal story arcs, you know. It'll be the story mm -hmm. of these happenings on the hunt in an arc across a wall, and they predate language. You know, narrative and story were an impulse within us before we actually spoke to each other. It's an amazing thing, you know. It's not my Q&A, but a quick question. Do you think the Queen of Dirt sort of re references that idea that life is chaos and it doesn't, it never quite adheres to... Oh, I've, oh for sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I don't strive to make things unexpected in novels, but I think they, they will arise because I believe that, you know. And, um, you know, the idea of the, um, I can't think of the um, economist's name, the, the, the concept of the black swan, you know, the, the thing you expect least in the universe is the thing that will fly into your garden and, and, and sit there and look in the window at you, you know what I mean? It's, and that, that's, and I, I love that. I love to be shocked into silence and fiction. 
I'll never forget the moment I read, you know, the way they say that um, the novel of The Godfather is, you know, it, 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 The Godfather is a great movie made from a bad novel. I mean, it's a great novel. Puzo was a fantastic writer, you know, and he knew his audience so well. But the moment in that novel where um, Sonny Corleone's face is revealed by The Undertaker when he lifts the blanket, I mean, I'll never forget the feeling in my stomach and my heart. I couldn't speak, I couldn't breathe, you know. I just, it was just incredible. You know, and I, I'd say that's the kind of writer I want to be. I want to be a writer who engages the reader completely, you know, and makes the reader feel the way I feel now. Not necessarily in a negative way or sad way, but just that kind, of, that that kind of shock. Like, yeah. Yeah. Do you have another question? Did everyone hear that? Oh, that's a great question, actually, yeah. I, oh, could we just mic that? Sorry. You know, I think, actually... Um, were, we were we asked the question oh, sorry, again? Yeah, just yeah, so sorry. People, sorry. Um, is, there much, is there much of an overlap between writers you love and writers who influence you? It's a great question. Um, and, you know, I definitely am influenced by every single writer I read. And I think we all, all of us writers are. I think everybody here who writes will, will, will agree to that, that everything you write will in some way inform what you write. Um, because we tend, I mean, we will, like Vonnegut said, it takes us five years to write out our heroes. And I absolutely agree with that. And Julian Goff says it takes 10 years, you know. And I think you have to write and write and write assiduously and laboriously um, until you feel you've, you're striking your own note. And I think we have to really listen to ourselves to our own physiological reaction to what we're creating. To, to, we have to listen to that for that moment when we feel we're striking our own note. Um, but there are writers who I don't enjoy, who, for, you know, whether it be some element of their craft that I really, really admire, you know, that I'll try to emulate or try to live up to in some way. You know, I think, and I think we're always trying to live up to our, to our favorite writers. We're trying, always trying to, to live up to the people who've gone before us. I think we have to, you know, I mean, I think we have to honour the, um, the, 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 the huge, incredible pantheon of, of writers, you know, if we're going to join them. Absolutely. But it's, it's, it's impossible not to be, I think, you know, even completely subconsciously you'll be influenced by, by what you read. It might just be that you'll say, I'll never do that. I'd never, I'd never write a sentence that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No? Okay. Um, do you give us an example of someone, um, not someone you never want to write, but, but growing up, sort of the first yeah. book that maybe... Oh, okay. Um, well, I think I loved Roald Dahl, but I mean, I think nearly every writer <laughs> would say Roald Dahl anyway, but I, it's just so incredible, you know. It, I mean, it was just, the magic of Roald Dahl was just unbelievable. Um, the, the, the novel, the, I think the first novel I read was Danny Champion of the World, you know, and it feels like a, a novel. It's, it's kind of novel length, you know, and it's, it's not patronizing. He, he never, ever talked down to children. Uh, you know, I mean, he, I know he loved his own kids dearly. He didn't seem to, <laughs> you know, and apparently he's being quoted, I think misquoted um, about children, you know, very negatively. Um, I think he was joking, to be honest, but you can get, you get the sense that he felt the children were kind of like colleagues who were as capable of bad behavior as he was, you know. He was on their level all the time. You, you never get a sense that Roald Dahl was patronizing mm. or talking down or being didactic or, think, or, or being pedagogical even. He wasn't saying, I'll teach you a lesson here now, child. You know, he was saying to them, this is how horrible the world is. This is how great the world can be. Oh, isn't it great? You know, I mean, some of his stories are so dark. Um, and then I remember reading um, Doris Lessing in my teenage years and just thinking she was just so incredible. The novel um, Memoirs of a Survivor, I remember reading it. Oh my God, it's unbelievable. And I remember thinking, God, this is fantastic, you know, this is, this is, this is sci-fi, this is my kind of book, speculative fiction. And then I realized, after reading it, how I'd been hoodwinked throughout the whole novel. There's really a novel about abuse, you know, mm. and about this person who's experienced something so awful that, they've, that, that, that even Doris Lessing has to deflect their pain into, this, into this, this parable set in the future where the world is starting to fragment because the person's being is fragmenting. It's just such an incredible thing. And we're thinking, like, you know, she must be a cold person to inflict such cruelty on me as a reader, you know, to make such a fool of me. But in a way, I felt lifted and I felt exalted by this, by this fact, you know, mm -hmm. she, that she'd done this. And it, it seemed like a kind of dark magic. She'd use words to do this because, I mean, language is so limited. Language is so finite. But still, she, she created this world, you know, that I could, I could feel every movement in, in the book. Is that the feeling of understanding? I was 
someone feels or understanding something you didn't understand before. I, I kind of other, yeah, you know. for sure. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there was so much in that that just that, that just seemed like this kind of ineffable power. Like there was, I couldn't articulate how I felt about it. Because I mean, <laughs> this is a stupid story, though, but I, I read Ulysses at 15 in order to impress my English teacher because I, I, I had a bad crush on her. You know, I really, I loved her. <laughs> so I thought if I read Ulysses, she'd be really impressed. And I did, I read it, you know. Um, and I remember thinking, I have no clue what's going on here, really, you know, but it just seemed so beautiful. I remember reading the sentence in, at the start of Ulysses, um, Stephen Dedalus is talking to his boss, and he thinks, and it, from his point of view, Joyce delivers this, on his wise shoulders, through a checker work of leaves, the sun flung spangles, dancing coins. I mean, that sentence just seemed so perfect. You know, I thought, I, I, I could spend my whole life trying to write a sentence like that, and never will. I mean, it says nothing, really. It's, it's, it's kind of a wry observation, because he's not wise, this man he's talking to, you know. But it, it's just, it describes how light is, is landing on the guy's shirt, you know, through a checkerwork of leaves, the sun flung spangles, that clause, the sun flung spangles, it's just so perfect, mm -hmm. you know. So that's, that's what I got from my first reading of Ulysses, um, the idea that I'd never, ever live up to that sentence, you know, which is a kind of a deleterious it's thing. It's terrible, really, yeah. That can happen too. Actually, I should have mentioned that in my answer. Actually, that, that some writers will put you off writing, and you have to you have to work against that all the time. Yeah. Donald, thank you. That was really that was fascinating. Oh, and, my pleasure. And entertaining and yeah. just wonderful. And congratulations on a thanks a million. Can I just book. say thanks, Elska, and, um, and to Una and everybody um, for your hospitality today at Sligo. And uh, your, your course is just amazing um, in Sligo, and your amazing teachers. It's been so great to be here. Um, I love this place, and thank you all so much for coming. It's been brilliant. Thank Thanks you, Tony. Thanks, Shaming. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm not sure. Can I just say, nothing I write will ever be as beautiful as the music that Shaming played. It was unbelievable. to present the open mic for us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Thanks again to Don and Elska. That was just great. I am a third year student of writing literature in IT Sligo. So I might tomorrow just lie down for the day and spend the day <laughs> painting, but I'll see. <laughs> Anyway, we have, I think, I think we should rename this from open mic, we should change it to writers coming out. So coming out in writing, this evening we're going to have five people. And the first person to read is going to be Mick Geelan. Mick. Thank you very much. I'm going to read two very short poems from my new book, Tell It As It Is. And if I might use this as a little promo, it's going to be launched in O'Donnell's pub in Cliffany on tomorrow night week. Uh, that's Thursday the 6th. And um, hopefully it'll be in the shops by October around the town. This one is called On the Platform of a London Tube. And now, 40 years from Leitrim, I meet you on the platform of a London tube. We stare at first and wonder, could it be? Then I slowly approach and you wait. You take my outstretched hand and squeeze my fingers. We say very little as we sit and still holding hands have coffee from a machine on the platform of a London tube. Coffee finished, we stand and embrace like two 20-year-olds at Drummond Station. And then you leave, misty-eyed, again. The other one. This one is a bit lighter. In my day, the old man said, we had no running water, no shower, no bath, in my day, he said, we washed in a basin at the kitchen table. First, we washed up as far as possible. <laughs> then, we washed down as far as possible. <laughs> and then he said, 
when nobody was looking, we gave possible a wee rub. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Mick, that was great. Just the contrast in those two poems is fantastic. And you can leave a pint behind us for us on behind the bar on Thursday week. Our next reader this evening is Shay Fahey. Shay. There's so many of you. <laughs> uh, this is just a short poem from the perspective of uh, someone who's always had a bit of trouble controlling their temper, and it's called Rabid Dog, so I hope you enjoy. The bones in the victim's knuckles were put under tremendous stress. The nails left a disturbing indent in the palm. The teeth appear to have been worn down, tiny fragments of the enamel chipped off through repeated grinding. Slander is an inexhaustible opponent. No shortage of ammunition, an ever-evolving force, impossible to contain, adaptable. And yet the reassurance that those who employ it are subjects of pity is of little comfort. A once docile dog was chained to a fence, its view akin to an old-fashioned camera. Dog equals good, cat equals bad. Then, out of undeveloped malice or sheer boredom, some ruffians started hurling stones at the hound. I have long since understood the temptation to exact what I would dub a fitting punishment, what I feel is worthy of the term justice, to demonstrate a feral capacity for violence. Bearing my fangs is, as violence is, only a temporary solution. The chain binding the beast was rusty. Perhaps a stone knocked the ancient padlock loose. They wanted a reaction to revel in your rage as the abused animal sought vengeance on those who wronged it. Complaints were made and the initially innocent who lashed out against injustice was put down. Thank you. Jay, fantastic. Thanks for that. Our next reader this evening is Sean Hickey. Sean? Hi. Um, this is a poem called After the Kingfisher. Away around the woody bend, not brooking approach, the kingfisher. Always away to be jeweled and elsewhere to dazzle some distant pond or furtive stream where the grey wagtail bobs on water smooth as stone. The kingfisher happens in summer when sunlight dapples the midgy pools and languid trout are sleek on a cloud-free day in August when leaves are still, immensity a ball in a dreaming boy's hand to throw at will. Away through the eye of the bridge, the kingfisher always away the watcher dizzy in his starting wake, and sorcelled on a river bank, suddenly bereft of profligate colour, a brilliant absence from astonished air. Thank you. Sean, that was beautiful. Thank you. And our next reader tonight is Joseph Matewa. My name is Joseph, I'm a student at Summerhill College, and there's a poem I wrote, it's called Lonely Cupid. Um, it's, not, it's, not a, a lo it's not a lonely poem, it's not a sad poem, it's not even an emotional poem. It's more an observatory, someone who is watching this lonely Cupid and the way he's dealing with his life. And I wanted it to be a nice twist on the role that Cupid has, being the god of love, and yet he has no love for himself. Lonely Cupid. The god of love, an excellent archer, prose the world, a persistent hunter, with a quiver full of erotic arrows to bury deep in each heart's barrows. Since he has the arrows, the bow with the string, who then shoots love to this love-giving being? Lonely Cupid. 
the physician who can't tell himself, the one with abundance of love to give, father of intimacy and desires mischief, yet still the same with no love to receive. For if Cupid hoards all the arrows of love, who then can make his heart flutter like a dove? Lonely Cupid, full and empty, like the best of us all, who when in love give our heart and soul, with no promise of the same, no, not in word, still would face for this love, fire and sword. We know how to love, so we are gods, and face the lonely existence of a god among mortals. Joseph, that was amazing. And I think that certainly it's my first time that I've heard a second level school writer at the word. So fair play to you. That's so impressive. Uh, I'm next. <clears throat> this is a piece called, it's a, I suppose, uh, nonfiction called Back in Bano. The road had a hint of grass down the middle. High hedges laden down with heavily scented honeysuckle created a roofless cave of safeness. It was another Bano summer. I was eight and walking from the island to the nun's house, flapping my brown leather sandals on the softening tar. Our five-person caravan was parked back at the grass beside the sandbank rushes. This year, four children had become too long to sleep crossways on a three-person caravan bed. We overflowed into the cotton canvas navy and orange A-frame tent, which was to become part of our annual packing as we headed to the island for a slow spell of summer. Four decades on, I'm back in Bano on a June day, camping at the bay, spitting distance from the island. I walk through the sun-scorched field along the cliffs overlooking the ruined Norman stone church, still used as a graveyard. I carefully descend a mud and sand bank to a hidden rocky beach, scramble over these rocks at high tide or walk around them at low tide, and you reach the island. Today, the tide is middling to halfway somewhere, I take to the higher rocks, the lower ends merge into the sand, which is appearing as wave by wave of the sea retreats on a tidal ebb. How do you describe the sense brought by a walk on a honeysuckle road, a scramble on the cliffs and a swim in the clear moving tide? Is it a moment in time, a specific scent, a falling together of circumstances? Why now, four de decades on, do I need to describe it? Describe it honestly and accurately. To dismiss Spano as an unspoiled summer holiday spot when the sun always shone and life was trouble-free creates a deep injustice in my psyche. Bano was unrestricting in a way that was more than physical. In addition to the gift of wandering safely, it gave momentary freedom from childhood anxieties and the space to imagine volumelessly with siblings or cousins, alone or secretly. It was the salve for my underestimated cares and responsibilities that seemed trivial now, but weren't then. Afraid of sleeping in the dark, panicked at not knowing the rules of a game of cards, stressed by rain-induced boredom and frustration, causing the explosion of small annoyances like, her elbow's touching my knee. A fear of bees, spiders, and crabs at different years. The fear of putting a hand into a cupboard for breakfast cereal and the agonizing shock of grasping a wasp instead. It could happen more than once. These anxieties can make or break a childhood holiday when each day is a whole life universe. Bano was waking in the morning, stretching into an eternal day. No telly, a transistor radio, plenty of books, tinned stew, tinned steak and kidney pies. The biggest treat was smashed, dehydrated potato mash. This convenience food never darkened the home kitchen, but was written into the holiday diet, along with spam on cream crackers and small jars of fish paste. I filled the empty jars with the dainty flowers that nestled in the prickly rushes, single-stemmed yellow silverweed, spherical clusters of five-petaled sea pinks interspersed with wild green succulent vetch. The same flowers still grow on the island, their sweet summer scents rising above the rushes to cosset the ocean. Despite the natural wastage of early debts, send, seldom mentioned, an emigration, a clatter of aunts and uncles, and most important, cousins, turned up on a daily basis. January after lunch on a sunny day. With a father who was from a family of nine, there was a choice of relations. We could be a group of one, two, three, or four families, with a few in-laws thrown in. Up the road, an aunt who was a nun would be staying at the, in the convent holiday home, the nun's house. 
Each sunny day, we spread out around the beach and Marham dunes, and on rainy days, we huddled under giant veils of raincoats and old Foxford rugs. In this open, endless gathering, children and adults wandered in and out of the central rug and towel space. Bonds were created that would be forgotten for a few decades until parental deaths brought us cousins back together. For the moment, this was living in the moment at its childhood's best and worst. Remember the wasting and the two years of not swimming for fear of crabs and others, other things, other below the water monsters. Child or adult, fear and anxiety is equally real. I'll stop there. Thank you. So that con concludes our evening, um, our open mic and our conversation tonight. Um, I just want to sp say thank you to Donal and Elke for this wonderful conversation this evening. I think we got um, the essence of Donal and his writing and the realness of his writing and uh, it was brilliant, really, really good. And the questions from the open, the Q&A just um, brought more out for us. Um, I just want to sp say thank you to Shami as well for providing the perfect music as well for the evening. And um, what else was I going to say? I better check my notes. <laughs> um, I just want to thank Una Mannion as well from ATU Sligo and from, um, from Maeve McCormick for presenting the um, open mic as well. And uh, a special thanks to Studio Row for looking after our tech support this evening as well. Um, our next event of the World takes place on Wednesday the 26th of October and will feature, for, feature photographer John Minahan with his Beckett and Wake presentation. John's talks are always wonderful, full of insightful anecdotes and humour, and f featuring Bacon and um, Burroughs. Um, you probably know some of, the, I think that picture up there, I think there's a picture there from John Minnan. You'd know some of his pictures, he's an amazing photographer. So if, if you have anybody interested in photography or art or just culture and history, it's a great, it'll be a great night. Um, I've also been asked you to let, let you know about an event that's happening in November in the model. Um, it's going to be a weekend mini festival celebrating um, the, the centenary of the writer Leyland Bardwell. So if you check the model website, there, there, there'll be information up there. But there's a mini, a mini festival, a weekend celebrating our writing. And, um, and I think that's everything. So thanks a million for joining us. And also, I left you out a survey there if you want to fill it in. And if you didn't get a chance to fill it in, if you go to sligolibrary.ie, it's up there as well. You can fill it in there. Um, so thank you for joining us this evening. And good night. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Like, nice to be here. Yeah, I'll finish off with a um, song written by a friend of mine called Tony Reedy, who's a, who's a pretty good command of language as well, well as being able to write a good song. It's all part of it. It's a song. Um, I think it's, it's I suppose the short explanation for this would be. Uh, would be that it's it's a, it's a song about a, a man working on the roads, and he just want to, he doesn't want to he, he kind of is kind of keeping up the manly face if you like with his mates, and he doesn't want to talk about a woman called Mary that he's fallen in love with basically, and the kind of the two thought the two thoughts are sort of existing side by side in the song. I'd like to, to thank thank Michelle and everybody the library for ha having us here as well. So. It's a little song called Hard Hat. Hope you enjoy this. And thanks for listening. When the big job is on, he is the one the boss relays on to get the job done. Then the move on to another town. He always stays with Mary. And at night in bed, the sounds in his hair, there's the shouts and roars, as the concrete pours, as the trucks slipping stones down in the hall. He puts his arm around his Mary. He wears a hard hat as a soft heart, but he doesn't show it to the man. Uh, we'll work on for the roar, lads. We'll work on till the end. Uh, we'll work on till the end. Well, he's up and away at the break of day, and they tower day in the muck and the clay. But the lads don't stay, cause he'd be okay for he'd be with his love on Sunday. 
And that 10 o'clock team, the eggs and pastry, pats on the beer, the track machine's here. Where's the engineer? Keep the head clear. He thinks of the day the team met her. Here's a hard hat, as a soft heart, but he doesn't show it to the men. Hey, we'll work on for another hour, lads. We'll work on till the end. Hey, we'll work on till the end. Get up again, he regrets the delay And so the sign says, don't lose your cool We'll be out here soon And we go for a spin on Sunday And on a fine May day When they cut the tape on the new roadway And the politician says, how's it going, Shay? All the suits are grey He brings it all back to Mary He wears a hard hat as a soft heart But he doesn't show it to the men I will work on for another hour, lads We'll work on till the end he wears a hard hat, has a soft heart, but he doesn't show it to the men. Hey, we'll work on for another hour, lads. We'll work on till the end. Yeah, we'll work on till the end.